it's not the loss of authenticity, it's the loss of our ability to recognize it, right? That's, that's the 21st century existential issue, which is terrifying. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Man, I feel so lucky I can actually wear a long sleeve shirt. Finally, it cooled off here in Florida. Today is the American author Walker Percy's The Movie Goer, published in 1961. This came highly recommended by my friends and patrons, Josh and Robert. Really appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. Josh, in particular, steadfastly kept after me to read it for several years. And Robert actually interviewed Walker Percy while he was doing uh, his thesis on Walker Percy's novels because of a chance encounter he had with one of Percy's friends on the train in New York. Just a totally coincidental encounter and then got the interview and finished his thesis, which won over great. And now the cassette is in the catalog of the uh, Morgan Library and Museum in New York. You can actually look it up on Google and see it in the catalog. It's pretty cool. I'd love to listen to it. Walker Percy was an American author and non-practicing doctor who, like Hubert Selby Jr., who I just reviewed, uh, had tuberculosis. Their styles couldn't be more different, but it is interesting to see how severe, life-threatening situations or illnesses can make writers out of people. I don't think it's a coincidence. A brush with death, one's own or another, uh, somewhere in their life, in their family or otherwise, uh, especially at a young age, tends to have remarkable consequences. Selby got it from cattle carcasses being transported on a ship over to Europe during the war. Percy got it while conducting an autopsy when he was studying medicine in New York. He went to a sanatorium in the Adirondacks in the mountains uh, to recover from it, as that's where they sent people who uh, got tuberculosis back then. Sanatoriums. Yeah. It sounds like Selby's was a much more harrowing experience, but they both lived into their 70s, with Percy living to 74 and Selby to 75. This is a short, quiet, existential, Southern novel, technically Southern novel, but it kind of transcends the Southern novel. It's the whole thing about it. That takes place in New Orleans, Louisiana in the 1950s, partly during Mardi Gras. It's kind of a blend of European existentialist fiction and American Southern fiction. And Robert also in our correspondence uh, mentioned the Camus connection. As he pointed to the novel's opening sentence, this morning I got a note from my aunt asking me to come for lunch, which of course sounds like a direct homage to the stranger's opening line, mother died today, aujourd'hui, maman est morte. I can't speak French. I'm not sure if Percy read much Camus, but uh, he certainly read a lot of what Camus was reading, like uh, Kierkegaard and uh, Dostoevsky. Jack Bickerson Balling, affectionately known as Binks, is a 29-year-old stockbroker living in New Orleans who is also a veteran and uh, was shot in the Korean War. He belongs to a stately Southern family commanded by his Aunt Emily, who's actually his great aunt, a mannered if not slightly dictatorial matriarch who reminds me of the mother in Suddenly Last Summer by Tennessee Williams, which I read, oh man, this, this, this best of 2023 is gonna be tough. I've read some damn good books. Venable, Violet Venable, right. She kind of reminds me of Violet Venable from uh, Suddenly Last Summer by Tennessee Williams. It's a great play. If you're looking for a Southern Gothic tale of dark psychology, that's a good one. And Binks is in love with his cousin Kate, who is actually the stepdaughter of his great aunt Emily. Uh, it gets pretty confusing in there, but uh, yeah. Kate is a dark, aloof, and precocious young woman who reminds me actually of uh, Alicia Western from uh, Cormac McCarthy's new uh, pair of novels, his last pair of novels, um, Stella Maris and uh, The Passenger. Stella Maris is the one wherein Alicia is the protagonist. However, The Passenger, which is the story of her brother, actually takes place in the same area as this one, which is uh, New Orleans. I'm almost certain McCarthy was aware of Walker Percy. Anyways, yeah, Kate in this one is uh, similar to Alicia in that she's beautiful, wicked smart, but psychologically troubled. Not as smart as Alicia Western. Alicia Western is like a like a, a mathematic prodigy. She's like a genius, like crazy genius. But uh, yeah, struggling with tremendous anxiety, more literal than philosophical, as in Jack's case, and bipolar it seems, with manic episodes of like you know ecstatic happiness followed by uh, deep dark periods of depression and like journeys inside herself. She and Binks seem to get along really well though. So Jack spends his time going to the movies wherein he takes part in what he calls the search. The search is an all-encompassing modus operandi in life, wherein Jack is trying to find the things that are living, that are real, true. Whereas most common, normal, well-to-do people seem dead, intellectually, spiritually, uh, just vacant. It could be the search for God as well. Uh, it, it, just, it certainly seems to be. Here is the popular description from page 13 of this edition. Uh, this is all about the search. Then it is that the idea of the search occurs to me. 
I become absorbed and for a minute or so forget about the girl. What is the nature of the search, you ask? Really, it is very simple, at least for a fellow like me. So simple that it is easily overlooked. The search is what anyone would undertake if he were not sunk in the everydayness of his own life. This morning, for example, I felt as if I had come to myself on a strange island. And what does such a castaway do? Why, he pokes around the neighborhood and he doesn't miss a trick. To become aware of the possibility of the search is to be onto something. Not to be onto something is to be in despair. The movies are onto the search, but they screw it up. The search always ends in despair. They like to show a fellow coming to himself in a strange place, but what does he do? He takes up with the local librarian, sets about proving to the local children what a nice fellow he is, and settles down with a vengeance. In two weeks' time, he is so sunk in everydayness that he might as well just be dead. What do you seek? God? You ask with a smile. I hesitate to answer, since all other Americans have settled the matter for themselves, and to give such an answer would amount to setting myself a goal which everyone else has reached, and therefore raising a question in which no one has the slightest interest. Who wants to be dead last among 180 million Americans? For as everyone knows, the polls report that 98% of Americans believe in God and the remaining 2% are atheists and agnostics, which leaves not a single percentage point for a seeker. For myself, I enjoy answering polls as much as anyone and take pleasure in giving intelligent replies to all questions. Truthfully, it is the fear of exposing my own ignorance which constrains me from mentioning the object of my search. For, to begin with, I cannot even answer this, the simplest and most basic of all questions. Am I, in my search, a hundred miles ahead of my fellow Americans or a hundred miles behind them? That is to say, have 98% of Americans already found what I seek, or are they so sunk in everydayness that not even the possibility of a search has occurred to them? On my honor, I do not know the answer. So it's vague, you know, but there's something there. There's an animated video utilizing that excerpt that I've linked to below that was sent to me by my friend and patron Levi. Thanks a bunch, man. There also seem to be different components of the search. Uh, there's like different um, elements. One is certification, the validation by cinematic ways of a time and place, thereby inscribing it like in history or reality as a real time and place, such as when Jack goes to see a, a film that was shot in the neighborhood he's living in. Another is repetition, which is uh, the pure experience of an uninterrupted segment of time that already occurred in the past, re-experiencing it in a form that is almost, if not as pure, as when one experienced it the first time. Tonight, Thursday night, I carry out a successful experiment in repetition. Fourteen years ago, when I was a sophomore, I saw a western at a movie house on Frerit Street, a place frequented by students and known to them as the Armpit. The movie was The Oxbow Incident, and it was quite good. It was about this time of year I saw it, for I remember the smell of privet when I came out and the camphor berries popping underfoot. There's a lot of sensorial detail in this book. It's almost like Proustian sometimes, right? In parentheses, all movies smell of a neighborhood in a season. I saw All Quiet on the Western Front, one of my first, in Arcola, Mississippi in August of 1941, and the noble deeds were done, not merely fittingly, but inevitably, in the thick singing darkness of Delta summer, and in the fragrance of cottonseed meal. Yesterday evening, I noticed in the Picayune that another Western was playing at the same theater. So up I went, by car to my aunt's house, then up to St. Charles in a streetcar with Kate so we can walk through the campus. Nothing had changed. There we sat, I in the same seat, I think, and afterwards came out into the smell of privet. Camphorberries popped underfoot on the same section of broken pavement. A successful repetition. A repetition is the reenactment of past experience toward the end of isolating the time segment which has lapsed in order that it, the lapsed time, can be savored of itself and without the usual adulteration of events that clog time like peanuts and brittle. Last week, for example, I experienced an accidental repetition. I picked up a German language weekly in the library. In it, I noticed an advertisement for Nivea cream, showing a woman with a grainy face turned up to the sun. Then I remembered that 20 years ago I saw the same advertisement in a magazine on my father's desk. The same woman, the same grainy face, the same Nivea cream. The events of the intervening 20 years were neutralized. The 30 million deaths, the countless torturings, uprootings, and wanderings to and fro. Nothing of consequence could have happened because Nivea cream was exactly as it was before. There remained only time itself, like a yard of smooth peanut brittle. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, these things that we do as humans, I think that we all have some version of these types of... Um, measurements of experience that we utilize or things, patterns of behavior that we employ, things we seek out. It's interesting. I've never seen a book articulate all of this. I've described my favorite films as being more real than real life, you know? And what greater form of all-encompassing pure repetition could be found other than in cinema, you know? That's what I thought. Like, 
Of course. There you go. That's it. For Binks, this doesn't seem to be his relationship with film, the thing that makes him the moviegoer on The Search. One doesn't have to go to the movies to be a moviegoer, as he relates to us, uh, once spotting a young romantic on a train reading Stendhal, right? You don't necessarily need to do anything in particular to be on The Search. It's just something you kind of fall into. It doesn't have to do with movies necessarily. I'm sure Jack thinks that most moviegoers are probably dead too, you know, they're completely sunken in everydayness, not searching for anything, just waiting to die, basically, right? It's this whole thing. He's, there's, he's, he's searching for life itself. He's searching for the pure experience of real life. And that's something that eludes, I think, the vast majority of human beings. He hasn't found it, and that much seems obvious, but he's trying to describe his method of searching for it because he's had glimpses or he's had intimations that there's something out there to find, right? At one point, they also visit Binks' family that lives uh, at this fish camp, and uh, he has a brother named Lonnie, a half-brother, who is disabled and in a wheelchair. Jack and him have a strong connection that is kind of unspoken. They're both moviegoers in Jack's sense, you know what I mean? And they have this kind of deep, unspoken, fraternal bond, which I thought was really cool. It's a sad book. It's a sad book. It's a sad book because real life is sad. You know, what more can I say? So aside from going to the movies, he pursues various girls. You know, some of them are his secretaries. He goes tooling around on the Gulf with them in his MG convertible. Must be nice. He's a good boy. He's a good Southern boy, you know? He visits his family. He puts a high priority on manners. He listens to his aunt's advice and wisdom and acquiesces as she tries to mold him into the greatness worthy of the family clan. The Southern dynasty, which she feels is in retrograde, which he admits in the form of himself, uh, it is. My aunt comes in smiling, head to one side, hands outstretched, and I whistle with relief and feel myself smiling with pleasure as I await one of her special kind of attacks. Attacks which are both playful and partly true. She calls me an ingrate, a limb of Satan, the last and sorriest scion of a noble stock. What makes it funny is that this is true. He's very much a yes ma'am, no ma'am kind of guy. A little devious and cheeky, but not obscenely lecherous. Yet his sense of a uh, tremendous, substantial gap in life is uh, omnipresent. What's missing in this life, right? What's, what's wrong? What's not here? What's, what's going on? <laughs> Ironically, as he points out in the book, the only time the everydayness broke, the only time he transcended it, the only time things felt real was during a complete disaster and brush with death when he was uh, shot in the war. His cousin Kate had a similar experience when she was involved in a car crash that killed her fiance. So, it's curious. Why does life only become real when it's so close to being over? I don't know. Life only seems to become real for these characters in moments of rupture. It takes very extreme events to puncture the veil of normality that we're all suffocated by, <laughs> you know? And I don't know if you can manufacture those. I wish you could, actually. I wish you could manufacture near-death experiences, but the safety surrounding doing something or attempting something like that seems dubious, so. I love these novels that take place in the South, you know, along the Gulf Coast, which I think is a really underutilized terrain, really beautiful, strange, strange atmospheric environment. Um, haven't read a lot of stories around it, but Binks is always on the move, pursuing women, the truth, and God, if you want to call it that, trying to avoid what he calls everydayness and malaise. He's trying to battle them off or push through them or evade them. In his MG, on a train, on a bus, walking around, he's forever wandering, right? Forever searching. In part, this was Percy's pursuit, because having studied science and philosophy and medicine and planning on studying psychiatry before getting tuberculosis, he seemed very preoccupied with the blatant issue stemming from common schools of thought in psychology and science. Incoherences, as he called them. Um, gaps, right? That is, according to him, there are massive, massive gaps, which he refers to as incoherences, in the understanding regarding what humans are, right? How one gets from cells to self, ego, and consciousness remains a true mystery. I mean, you can't kick consciousness, you know? These are elusive conceptual elements that just don't behave the same way as a lot of science. It's from a talk I've linked to below. He said, we do not find it odd that there is only one science of chemistry and neurology, but at last count of over 600 schools of psychotherapy and growing. 
His pursuit didn't lead him to atheism like Camus, but uh, rather to Catholicism like Flannery O'Connor. As far as I can see, the result is the same, right? Percy is as good an author as either, and uh, better than Camus, for me. The way you can tell America is in decline is by measuring your time, your free time that you can spend on existential dread. The percentage of Americans who have the time to gaze off in like a Terrence Malick kind of manner at natural vistas and women or whatever and think for themselves is at a low previously unthought of in the two prior generations, I'd wager. Trivia, he was actually gonna adapt the film into a screenplay, but after Katrina decided that that New Orleans was basically gone, tragically. No normal American has any time to do anything but try not to drown financially right now. And I'm, and I'm, of course, no psychic or economist, and don't take anything I say seriously in these reviews, but the next 10 years, that's all it's going to be. I almost guarantee you. So what is so strong about the moviegoer? Uh, what, is so, what is so compelling and interesting? I mean, aesthetically, I mean, it's the tone and language Percy employs for me. Percy's quiet narrative builds to a kind of lashing climax from Jack's aunt that is so taut and articulate, it's something to marvel at even being only a page and a half long or so. It's so, it's, there's no real traditional story three act structure thing going on. I don't think, maybe if we plotted it out on a, uh, on a graph, but it's pretty subtle. Each section is not particularly tonally distinct from the others. It's not a traditional type of novel, but it's not so radical that it's experimental or something. Percy's descriptions are truly poetic. I mean, Rhythmical. That is, he's chosen words to place one next to the other that tend to hypnotize you. It has the same effect as certain jazz musicians I like to listen to. Maybe some like uh, Dexter Gordon or uh, Chet Baker, you know? Uh, this kind of beautiful, tragic, uh, quiet melancholy. His evocative descriptions of plants, birds, light, and the architecture of New Orleans. His inner observations confessed and related to us. It's a beautiful novel to fall asleep to, actually. And Percy's knack for describing things definitively and accurately in social situations that you may have felt or experienced yourself but not thought through entirely is ah uh, what's a what's a word for novel right it's like new never captured with words right he's cataloging very distinct um difficult to describe sensations or modes of action or behaviors that a human being takes part in or, 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 or does internally, right? It's not stuff that can be measured very well. We all have these kind of mechanisms inside us that are kind of tuned into certain things. But to try and describe them to another human being and, and you know, have a conversation about them or bond over them is is very difficult right you know we can we can kind of get there but not really whereas you know this is a beauty of literature this is this is where it this is kind of where it um surpasses film because literature is internal film is external right now the the external can be grandiose and glorious don't get me wrong it's the ultimate medium but liter but it can't go to the places that literature does and that's that's the power of books there you go He's cataloging these things. You see, this is, again, I think I've said something similar, but this is like what great authors do. They articulate things that can't be articulated or, or are very difficult to articulate, right? They successfully are able to communicate things to you that are extremely complicated, but that you already know or have experienced, or, or maybe will when you're a little bit older. It depends on when you're reading this, you know. Uh, I'd say by the age of 30, 35, 40, you know, you've probably gotten a lot of the, the uh, ideas communicated in this novel. Paul Ellie, who wrote the afterword uh, for this edition, writes that it's about how we see things, a novel of perception and sensibility, dealing with the search for authenticity in a scripted, stylized, mediated world. Could there be a more timeless premise of more relevance today in 2023? No. <laughs> If anything, his search has become common, right? As so many of us are completely sapped of authenticity that, that we don't even recognize it when it walks up to us and starts talking to us, which may finally be the ultimate danger of the 21st century, in my opinion. Not the loss of authenticity, right? Well, maybe indirectly the loss of it, but rather the inability to recognize it when it presents itself. The loss of it because we're not able to see it anymore. We're barely able to trust our own perceptions. Our sensibilities are always in question. It's not 
the loss of authenticity, it's the loss of our ability to recognize it, right? That's, that's the 21st century existential issue, which is terrifying. <laughs> our suspicions always raised and our awareness of the passing of time more than ever weighing down on our minds and bodies, pummeling us like an existential hammer with each passing year. Or maybe that's just me and how I feel on my birthdays. Anybody else get that? Maybe it's the coffee. I often saw the book as kind of a um, almost film noir in my head. It's, it's not a film noir, you know, atmosphere in the book, but uh, I, I thought black and white. And I thought uh, Cary Grant for playing Jack, of course. Cary Grant's fixed smile now taking on a kind of ironic look. Those big brown eyes gazing where Grant would normally never gaze with that smile. But now you know with like voiceover from the book what's actually going on in Jack's head. Uh, I think Grant could do that perfectly because Jack is, Jack in the book is, is hiding in public. He's hiding his intellectual despair. And his existential intellectual despair. And, and something about the, the figure that Cary Grant cuts is, uh, is so perfect for embodying that. I don't think Cary Grant ever had like a properly dark role, but this would have been the one for him, were he to have had one. Wouldn't it be cool if AI got so good that one day it was actually able to cast deceased movie stars into new films? That'd be so rad. What is Jack really searching for? Is Kate insane? Is Jack insane? Do they really love each other? Do we know what real love is? In the end, perhaps it could be that none of the answers sought by myself, you, or Percy are really that important. You know, because life is not a film. Perhaps every answer is just another question or another multitude of questions, an endless ocean of questions. As Jessica Hooten Wilson writes in the article I've linked to below, for Percy, we are wayfarers and pilgrims. And he always used we because in this search, we are not alone. The book has all the narrative closure of an Antonioni film. That is none. Walker Percy had a hell of a life from that same article by Wilson. Both of his parents committed suicide, uh, separately. His father and his grandfather both shot themselves, and his mother drove her car off a bridge. His ancestor, the first American Percy in his family, tied a kettle around his neck and drowned himself. Suicide seemed like his inheritance, his birthright, his fate. Not even Hemingway or Thomas Mann had that much suicide in their family. Both parents, separately? Grandfather, father, and mother? And the article points out, this is another Camus connection as the myth of Sisyphus is fundamentally predicated on that question, the only philosophical question, as Camus puts it, that of suicide. Kate, in the book, describes life as being fine so long as she knows she can kill herself. I remember in an interview, it might have been with Playboy magazine, wherein the Chilean author, Roberto Bolaño, said something similar about getting through certain parts of his life only because he knew he could kill himself. And I think other, other authors have said the same thing. Chiron, Chiron, I'm pretty sure, has said the same thing. But to have all those things pushing you towards it and then not do it is fascinating. Certain characters in history seem to have had the dominoes set up in that fashion where it's like it would be no surprise if they had committed suicide. But then they decide not to and they live through it. Percy was one of them as well as Chiron and Welbeck. You can be predisposed through depression or um, actions of your family or your friends or otherwise. And uh, you don't have to do it. You don't have to take the same steps they did. Just because you were born with depression or certain people in your family or your friend group took those steps doesn't mean you have to come to the same conclusions. It doesn't. You don't, you know, and that's great. And thank God, right? Free will is a beautiful thing, that's all I can say. It seems that this novel changed what the Southern novel, right, could be. And Josh told me this story. Walker Percy was actually friends with the historian and author uh, Shelby Foote, who wrote several books on the Civil War, which were actually sent to me by Dana. Thank you very much, man, really appreciate it. But uh, Josh, told me about this anecdote wherein um, Percy and Foote uh, got together and they went up to go visit Faulkner in Mississippi. They got a chance to go and speak with him. And Percy was so nervous, so in awe of the, you know, this literary monolith the entire time that he, that he couldn't even say anything. And uh, so Faulkner and Foote had a conversation. Yeah, certainly as Robert pointed out, uh, Aunt Emily in part represents Faulkner making these seemingly obvious and comprehensible statements that actually aren't obvious nor comprehensible when broken down. Grand declarative statements about like man and duty and honor or whatever, I don't know. When she says, in this world, goodness is destined to be defeated, but a man must go down fighting, 
that is the victory. To do anything less is to be less than a man. And Jack's listening to her and thinking, she is right. I will say yes. I will say yes even though I do not really know what she is talking about. As Robert pointed out, that's a pretty good jab at Faulkner. I, I would say it's also a jab at Hemingway. But the moviegoer, while being a southern novel, does not feel like a southern novel. It's far more Camus than it is O'Connor, which makes it a highly original piece of work for the place and time it came out of. What helps is that it is an absolute miracle of human writing. Stunningly beautiful, but in a quiet, subtle, and dignified way. Better than food. One of the best of the year. Check it out. So you should read it. Undoubtedly Fans of Stoner by John Williams. Uh, certainly if you're a fan of McCarthy or Flannery O'Connor, or Faulkner, goes without saying. Um, any kind of southern gothic fiction, for sure. But yeah, even though it's a southern novel, it doesn't really feel like one. Just a heads up, there is some casual racism. It was a common trait of the era. It was the 50s and 60s, so that is present. All right. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar, and for each review I do, I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out, they are sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And the coffee is delicious. If you would like to get in on that and help support the show, thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate it. You can click on the link below and go to Patreon and donate $5 or more per video. Thank you very much. Helps keep this whole thing going. And if you donate just $1 or more per video on Patreon to the show, you'll get access to the cool stuff listed below, including the patron-only reviews, plus all these reviews ad-free. Please check it out. Thanks a bunch. Thank you very much to all my patrons, and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Tim. Tim G. Thanks a bunch, Tim. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive The Moviegoer by Walker Percy, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly, and I hope you love both. Cheers. And I hope you're doing well, man. I hope you're keeping up the jujitsu. Tim's a poet from England who's friends with Neil Gaiman and does jiu-jitsu. Not with Neil Gaiman, but that'd be really funny if they did. So, anyways, he's a cool guy. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Have a great night. And always remember, bring a book wherever you go. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.